the, the constitution uh, of Botswana, um, section 17.1, uh, grants the president the right uh, to declare a state of emergency at any time. And uh, the constitution is, is framed now um, says that the president upon uh, declaring a state of emergency has to um, call parliament uh, and, and if he wants uh, the period for which the state of emergency to last to move beyond uh, the, the time that is set for, for, for him. So um, the constitution then says um, if he calls the, the, the parliament, parliament can give him a maximum of six months, uh, within which then the president needs to set very clear guidelines as to what is going to happen. Now, what, what happens is that when the president goes to, to parliament, he, parliament in its wisdom can say to him, Okay, we give you two months and then we come and review or we give you the whole six months. You have had debates in parliament where some members were saying, well, um, we don't need you to give you the whole six months. We can give you three and come and review and, and come back. But what is important here is that during the state of uh, emergency, uh, the president uh, is empowered uh, to take uh, decisions. The president is empowered to do things in a mass, uh, much faster way uh, as opposed to uh, when there is no state of emergency where other uh, you know, processes of government happen. So some people have argued that there is a possibility of abuse in the state of emergency because there is no accountability and the, 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 some procurement procedures are, are circumvented and uh, some decisions that would uh, perhaps require certain processes uh, do not because then we, we say that uh, it's in a state of emergency and therefore the president is the one that should take uh, those decisions. So um the other argument that uh, has come across has been that um you have another law you have another law which is the public uh, health uh, act which act um allows for um curtailing of some freedoms uh, with regard or uh, with with the view to control disease and um, that is, you know, in position of uh, uh, lockdowns and um, restriction of movements. Uh, and uh, the argument has been that uh, this law, from the, coming from the ruling, uh, the, the ruling side of the of the parliament, has been that this law is inadequate because uh, you need uh, the president now to be the one the helm, the driving seat during a crisis. It would have been more prudent uh, for us to identify whatever gaps uh, they are within the Public Health Act and plug them uh, within a certain period, maybe to say, let's give the president three months uh, state of emergency and then while we attend to the the Public Health Act, because you see, uh, this this thing is about it's a delicate balance between fighting the disease and at the same time keeping the economy going. Because uh, if if you do not achieve that delicate balance, uh, then it, it it defeats the very purpose for which you you are trying to uh, you you are you are introducing the state of emergency for. So I think it's one of those things that as we look back after post-COVID, if ever there will be such post-COVID, uh, I think lessons that are going to be drawn would be how do we, um, how, how do we strengthen laws such as uh, the Public Health Act to avoid 
resorting to the state of emergency because state of emergency uh, is is a bit drastic and I think it has uh, unwarranted and unwanted uh, uh, you know uh, repercussions in terms of the economy that's why uh, right now we have we have an economy that is on its knees the South African uh, government, for example, chose to go uh, use a different uh, route or law, which is um, the Disaster uh, Control Act. So uh, I think there is uh, there is a whole argument here whether we want to halt everything, take uh, the checks and balances out of the window, and uh, have a country run. Uh, by the president alone uh, for this long. And I think the unintended consequences of this is that you then have no accountability, as I've said. That's why parliament has, has, has demanded and have not been given up to now a report uh, of funds that were channeled to the uh, COVID response uh, fund. Uh, the private sector has also, uh, uh, you know, plowed money in there, uh, but nobody is, is is willing to account. As much as people may argue that we needed it at, at the at the beginning, I think we did not need it at all for this long because then we would have used the shortest period possible. Uh, to, 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 to capacitate laws such as the Public Health Act. In the recent past, uh, during uh, President uh, Mukhae's tenure, um, there was a looming crisis, if you remember, uh, where um, there was going to be disenfranchisement of um, a lot of voters uh, who who were not part of uh, the approved uh, uh, national um, voter uh, registration at the time. So the president evoked this uh, uh, provision to declare a state of emergency and recall parliament and uh, had to, 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 to change the law to accommodate uh, these voters and avoid uh, disenfranchising them. So that's the um, um, that's that's one occasion where I can remember the state of emergency being used, but I don't remember a state of emergency lasting this long. I think uh, the cry mostly right now is that uh, you you can't have a, a country uh, running through a state of emergency for almost two years and expect the economy to be alive, expect uh, human rights, expect uh, um, democratic rights that are enshrined in the Constitution to continue thriving. I know that the President said that he uh, intends to uh, only use state of emergency for purposes of fighting the disease, uh, but we have seen sporadic events of um, uh, public brushes with the police and uh, some of them, some of the charges that they have been accused of were based on the state of emergency regulations, uh, like uh, uh, publishing informa misleading information against the regulations that would have been published at that time. So I think uh, it's, 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 a, it's an unprecedented uh, length of time that we have seen a state of emergency going for. Uh, and, and I think even the example that I gave, uh, you, you would realize that uh, there could have been very little uh, or no other way around the, the challenges that the then president found himself in. So I think we, we, we have had a situation where uh, the provision is, even as presidents and government knew it existed, have always been wary of using it. Uh, they, 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 they knew that it has to be used under very exceptional circumstances. 
if you like. This is a, an exceptional circumstance, but I think uh, it ought to have been used limitedly and also within a period that could have allowed us to capacitate whatever law uh, that we could have used instead of state of emergency, in this case, the, the Public Health Act. The intention of the framers of our constitution was uh, to empower the president uh, during a crisis to be able to respond fully and timelessly. And I think one of the um, advantages of having a state of emergency uh, would be that if you are to um, make um, procurements, for example, in this case of, of vaccines, uh, you shorten the processes and uh, things that would make it take long because then under state of emergency, the president is empowered and the cabinet is empowered uh, to do that which is in the interest of the nation. So the, the, the bureaucracy is cut uh, for the public interest. Uh, but I, 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 I say that guardedly because um, I know that uh, there is always an opportunity for abuse. And I think um, this is the suspicion right now that uh, even as we have had uh, times without number that uh, there has been purchases and procurement done of vaccines, the nation has always uh, has been left to question and ask uh, when were these purchases made? Why are the vaccines uh, so so sluggish in arriving? Uh, even that, even such that the the donations are arriving much faster than what we are said to have procured. So it 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 then defeats the very purpose. Uh, it, it it then cancels out the very argument that I'm making that. Um, uh, the presidency uh, or the cabinet or the government is empowered to then do things speedily uh, in the in the best in the best interest of the nation and i think um you know democracy uh, uses tools such as bureaucracy such as checks and balances to ensure that we we we, we avoid abuse and i think uh if state of emergency was used and 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 uh, implemented, as I said, within a very uh, strictly um, defined uh, timelines, I think we would have benefited more from it than having uh, open-ended six months state of emergencies. That's why the framers of the constitution said parliament can give the president up to six months. It doesn't say that six months or, or the man, that the, the, the six months is mandated. So it, it, it was meant that the parliament in its wisdom uh, can determine the time. But then you see the challenge with us here is that we have what I've always termed the tyranny of majority because uh, we have a very funny situation where uh, not only do you deal with um, um, uh, an overwhelming majority of the ruling party in parliament, but you also have a situation where the ruling party has determined that uh, its caucus resolutions are binding. When you go to the caucus of the ruling party, uh, at any given time, uh, the front bench outnumbers the back bench, which means that the view of the cabinet in the BDP uh, caucus will always prevail. Uh, if they come out of the ruling party caucus with the view of the front bench, they go to parliament as a unit, it means that parliament will only serve to rubber stamp uh, the views of, of the of the executive, which which is for me unfortunate, uh, and I think an upfront for for democracy. The principle there should be to say, uh, how do we make sure that this uh, state of emergency uh, aids only uh, the purpose for which we asked for, and uh, and avoid those excesses. And I think. Um, 
if if you um, remember, I said that after declaring a state of emergency, the president is required to then publish a set of rules and regulations in the government gazette. These rules and regulations are then to be adhered to. Uh, you, you you then have to, uh, the public has to adhere to them and the, the, the law enforcement officers have to uh, enforce. If the president says, as he has now said, that uh, there is a curfew uh, at eight. Um, uh, all law-abiding citizens are supposed to abide by that, and law enforcement officers are supposed to uh, enforce. And um, if, if the regulation says that you can only meet uh, if your number does not exceed 50, those regulations have to be published and made known to the public, and then state apparatus have to implement. I think situations do differ, but um, I do not think that uh, you would have any um, case study of a functional democracy that has um, declared and um, allowed state of emergency in the manner or in the context of Botswana uh, to proceed uh, for period uh, for as long as we have here. Uh, countries, some countries, uh, and to the best of my understanding, in countries like uh, the US, for example, they would have a, a higher let uh, level of, of, of security, which means that they are now you, they they have legal instruments that allow them during that period to do certain things uh, expeditiously to do certain things uh, you know with, with without too much bureaucracy uh, but it doesn't have the broad reach of a state of emergency here where um, as I said, it's, 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 it's cross-cutting. Uh, it affects all aspects of human life. Uh, it, it literally brings everything to a halt. And I think it, it, it doesn't aga well for, for democracy because uh, we have seen a situation, or we have seen situations where governments uh, then get used to uh, ruling under state of emergency and presidents start enjoying calling the shots and uh, they then uh, make it now official that uh, we we want to uh, I want to be in charge and I don't want to be asked questions so if the culture continues where you have uh, billions of public funds used and nothing uh, is accounted for I, I think that can't be said to be good at all. The Constitution um, itself sets out uh, what what is called um, um, entrenched rights, which means that you have um, rights or, provi or entrenched provisions, which uh, if you are to change them, you go through a different process. If you change the constitution, for example, and the, the provision is not entrenched, you do not need um, you do not need a referendum. But if you change an entrenched provision, you need to go to, to consult the public. I'm raising this because they are what I would call a facilitative and foundational rights. Uh, like freedom of expression, for example. Uh, uh, the freedom of expression is facilitative and foundational because it is through it that you enjoy any other right. Uh, your, 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 your right to life is anchored on your knowledge that you have that right. Uh, and that knowledge comes through uh, information, through being able to receive and share information. So uh, um, I've been very worried when I realized that, uh, you know, 
Uh, there has been, as I said before, attempts uh, to censor what people say, uh, to say that uh, you, what you've said is, is uh, detrimental to government's efforts to fight COVID, uh, and therefore we, we are charging you. I think for me, uh, that's going overboard because if you are going to deny the freedom of expression, uh, then you, you have, you have, you have now, uh, graduated into a full blown, uh, dictatorship because people then do not have, uh, the right, uh, to hold views, express their views, share their views, and, um, you know, receive whatever information that, 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 that is out there. So this is one of the examples in terms of the rights that I'm saying shouldn't be touched. That's why the Constitution makes it very clear that under which circumstances should such a right be limited. There are clearly defined limitations to the freedom of expression, uh, right, as enshrined in our Constitution. The framers of our Constitution, uh, by involving Parliament uh, in uh, um, authorizing the length of state of emergency, they were uh, uh, thinking about providing the checks and balance to say the president should be shouldn't be the only one who says I'm declaring the, the, the state of emergency for this period. I think it's only unfortunate that we have a parliament that, for all intents and purposes, is a department in the office of the president. And uh, what the president wants, the president gets. Uh, and it, even if what he wants is not reflective of the uh, views and, uh, and, and interest of, of the public, I think... Uh, Oh, uh, one would say that if there was a fully functional uh, democracy and a strict adherence to the uh, to the separation of powers, where you have equal um, arms of government, the legislature, the judiciary, um, and the executive, and we do not have an overbearing and domineering executive. Uh, that has doffed parliament to just a rubber stamping inst uh, institution, then would have had checks and balances um, because then parliament would apply its wisdom and say to the president, we give you this time, we'll come back and review. But now we, we have seen a situation where the president has been given six months whenever he wanted up to now, and they are also, there's also talk that he will get another six months, which for me uh, is, is akin to giving, giving him a blank check. Uh, in the context of the framers of our constitution and our republic, I think in their wisdom, they believed that um, uh, parliament, as the voice of the people and the custodians of the public pass, through this requirement, uh, that they authorize the period of the state of emergency. They should be the ones that then comes back and evaluates and say, you know, um, we think that in our wisdom, uh, we have come out of the woods and therefore we stop the state of emergency here. Or uh, we think that uh, now uh, we need to, to extend. But I think the only challenge that I see is that we 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 have um, we, we we have uh, a very weak parliament uh, that simply endorses that which the executive and the president wants. I think that's where the anomaly is. That's where the weakness is. Uh, I've said this before that if we had a parliament, a strong parliament, properly capacitated with its own budget office, that says to the government or to the executive, you are asking for two billion as seed fund uh, for the COVID-19 response. We have done our own due diligence and this is what we think is required. 
uh, then parliament will make informed decisions. But in a situation where parliament can't have its own estimates, it doesn't have its own economists, it doesn't have its own professionals uh, to assist members of parliament in making these decisions. They are dependent on what they are told uh, by, 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 by the executive and the ministers. Behind the ministers are technocrats. And that's why functional democracies have technocrats for parliament that are paid by parliament, that are independent of government. That would say to uh, members of parliament, um, here is our own budget. Contrary, and uh, you can just oppose that with the budget that has been presented by the executive, and they are able to then streamline and say, according to us as parliament, here are the priorities, and therefore uh, channel more resources to this. So I think uh, we, we one hopes that as we as we discuss the looming uh, constitutional review, we address this anomaly. Uh, of of uh, the three arms of government, and we 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 transform we transform uh, our governance structure such that it is it is able to truly provide for checks and balances. But one need to take interest uh, in these matters. They need to inform themselves around the you know, repercussions of all these decisions. And as we talk about uh, constitutional review, they need to know exactly what needs to be done. Um, I have heard people saying, no, state of emergency is okay because um, we are fighting uh, a disease, we are fighting a crisis, but then they do not delve into the nitty gritties of whether if you are giving uh, somebody a blank check, uh, how do you then provide for, for, for checks and balances? What are the limitations in terms of um, um, democracy, in terms of good governance during a state of emergency? And I think these are questions that we need to think about uh, and I think we are in this problem right now uh, because it's precisely because of that, that we did not ask the right questions, that if you take public funds and uh, donations from the private sector into a fund, how are they going to be accounted for? Uh, who is going to account? Because in a state of emergency, some of the latitudes that um, that are there for institutions like parliament are limited. Uh, I don't even think that anybody is going to be held accountable for all these excesses that we see. So I think what, what I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to buttress is that a democracy thrives uh, where the populace is informed, the populace has an interest in what is going on. They ask the right questions instead of looking away disinterested. Mm-hmm.